OK? Let's hope it doesn't change again. OK, um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Carl, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, symbolic execution and uh, some things you can uh, do with it, including uh, using it in exploit development and the code deobfuscation. Really quick about myself first. Uh, as I said, my name is uh, Carl. I'm 27 years old, and uh, I'm a master's in computer science from the Royal Technical Institute here in Stockholm. I currently work as the head of security at the healthcare startup Kru. And uh, in my spare time, I play a lot of CTFs for the Swedish team Hacking for Sodium. And if you would like to get in contact with me uh, later, you can, for example, choose from any of these methods. But let's get into the topic. So uh, symbolic execution is probably most easily explained by contrasting it with um, normal, regular, or concrete execution. So typically, when you execute a program, you have some specific uh, input, and your variables have some specific value, like five, or hello world, or something. So you might have some, some uh, instruction that says that you should take uh, the value of register A, which might contain three, and register B, which might contain five. You should add them together and save them in register C, which will then get the value eight. When you're doing symbolic execution, what you instead uh, are doing is that you're treating this like, uh, like algebra. You're just saying that uh, the value in register C will be the sum of register A and B, whatever that is. And uh, um, the uh, upside of this is that you can kind of explore all different possibilities uh, at the same time. You don't have to choose a specific value. Uh, the problem with it is that uh, there can be a lot of uh, different possibilities and combinations. So they can, this can very quickly get completely com computationally infeasible. But we can still use it to get some practical results. So uh, I'm going to uh, uh, show this with a framework called Anger, which is a binary analysis uh, framework. Uh, with, which you can use for many things, including um, uh, symbolic execution. Uh, and uh, it's developed by the Computer Security Lab at UC Santa Barbara. And it uses the Microsoft uh, C3 SMT solver internally, if you're familiar with that. It, it uses it to like, solve the different uh, states and constraints it sets up while doing the symbolic execution. So generally, when we are uh, trying to exploit something, um, we have some end goal in mind. But one very common intermediate step is to gain control of the instruction pointer. Typically, it's not like the end goal. You typically want like to get the shell or something. But gaining control of the instruction pointer is a very common and very important intermediate step. And uh, you can then break that down into further intermediate steps. You might, for example, say that if I could call this function with uh, a pointer pointing to a buffer which is larger than 200 bytes, then I know that the buffer will overflow and will get gain control of the instruction pointer. So that you could like break this down into intermediate steps. Um, so what you can use uh, Anger for is that you can tell Anger to uh, take this binary go out and like, explore it and try to find a way to reach a specific address within the code. Like find some input or some state which makes this uh, part of the code execute. Uh, what we then can do additionally is to like, add the further constraints. Like, the, like what I said, my, we might say that we need to reach the end of this function, but we can put on the additional constraint that the size of this buffer should be uh, larger than 200, for example. And then Anger can try to like, solve this problem that we have set up and try to give us some input which will satisfy these conditions. So I'm going to use uh, an example from the Security Fest uh, CTF uh, from this year. And in this code, uh, the code does a lookup in a, in a table of function pointers. And uh, we then know that if we could get this lookup to read out of bounds of this table, uh, we could cause some unexpected behavior, which possibly could be uh, exploitable. We also, I'm also going to show how we can get rid of some code uh, which we, we know doesn't contribute to the res results to make the computation um, simpler. 
So the simple program we are uh, looking at looks like something like this. Is this readable from the back? So uh, great. Um, it's a very simple program. It prints out some, it does some setup, prints out the menu, and then there's a loop where it prints out the menu, ask for a, or for a choice, and then it uses this choice uh, in line 21 to uh, pick out a function pointer from a table, and then on line 23 it calls that function. A simple program. So we w what we are interested in is if we could get the lookup and on line 21 to read out of bounds, then we could cause some unexpected behavior when the call is made on line 23. Uh, so first we're going to do some setup in, in Angular. Um, basically, we're just loading in uh, this binary, and we're also creating like a little helper function to translate addresses uh, between what Ida Pro uh, uses as a base address and what Angular uses as a base address. So that's just like bookkeeping stuff. Uh, but then, if we look at this code again, you see on line 20 there is a memset uh, call, and uh, it involves some global variables but they are not really used uh, in this part of the code. So we can, by inspecting this code, see that uh, actually this is not relevant for what we are specifically looking at here, but it causes uh, the number of different possible combinations and states to increase a lot. So we'll just get rid of that by uh, hooking it. So the last line here in the code, we're just hooking uh, this uh, address. So hex fad is where this memset call is made. So we, we're saying that just replace this with a function that does nothing, um, because we, will, we know that it doesn't affect anything. And then, if we look at the code again, uh, we're not going to start from the beginning, because there's a lot of stuff here we don't really care about, like printing out the welcome message and the menu and stuff, which makes things complicated. And also, this like converting a string into a number is also something which causes a lot of different combinations to appear. So we're just going to start inside the else clause, from where we take this choice and make this calculation and then uh, make the call to the function pointer. So if we look at the assembly of this instead, okay, this is not very readable, but at the top we load the uh, variable uh, from the stack and then further down, almost at the end of this, we use this to index into the, um, or the, the result of this calculation, we use to index into this table. So what's important to note is that the RDX register holds uh, the index of the table. So that's the information we're going to need. And we're also going to need the address where we're starting at hex f46. And the lookup is made at hex fbf. So we then go into Angular and uh, set, it up, set this up. So we say that we're going to start as address uh, hex uh, f46. Um, we tell Angular where this... Um, the choice variable, the, the one that user, the, where the user input is located on, on the stack relative to the base pointer. And then we tell Angular that this is our like symbolic input value. Currently, this can have any value. We don't know anything about it. It can have any value. And then we go out and uh, explore. So we start at this address, F46, and we run it until we reach address FBF. Um, which it trivially will, because there are no branches or anything, so we will just continue down there, and we will reach that state. Uh, but that's not enough, because we want this to be out of bounds in the table. So we add this additional constraint that, okay, you can reach this address, but we are only interested in the cases where the RDX register... So, uh, quick note here, the table has eight entries, so the maximum valid index is seven. So we're interested in cases where the RDX register is less than zero or greater than seven. We add this constraint and we let Angular crunch this for a little bit. And if you run this, uh, it will print out this. So if you use this input to the program, the big number starting with 214, um, this will cause the RDX register to have uh, the value minus two uh, when we make the lookup, which is uh, not inside the table. So we are now reading outside uh, the table. And uh, this then causes, uh, I mean, initially, if you run the program, just input this, this causes a crash. But it turns out that you can control this crash and then go from there to exploit the, the, the binary. Uh, but that's not uh, part of this uh, example. OK, so that's a little bit about how you can use it for exploitation. Uh, you can also use it for deobfuscation. So generally, when, um, when you obfuscate code, the goal is to make it 
um, more difficult to read for either humans or computers. And there are different common techniques like control flow flattening, uh, where you like mess up the control flow. Uh, you can have a packer which unwraps codes layer by layer. You can have a dropper with down which downloads uh, more code. Uh, you can have your own virtual machine, so essentially creating your own programming language and then implement the code in that. Uh, or you can use something uh, called dead code insertion, which is basically you just like spray the code with instruction that cont contributes nothing to the end result, either because it operates on dummy data or because the operations cancel out. Like you uh, insert an increment in one place and then a decrement a few lines later. So they're just completely ir irrelevant and just makes the code difficult to read. Uh, and our goal here is to like, undo this mess, and this is generally a hard problem because it's kind of difficult to know what we're aiming for, what is like the canonical representation of a program, and uh, it's very difficult to like fully automate this process. But we're going to use Angular to uh, specifically look at this dead code insertion and a specific example of it. Uh, so we're going to like prove. And this, is, this goes back to what I said, like we treat this as like an algebra thing. So we're going to prove that some code is useless and that a specific value will always have the same um, value, no matter what. So this is a, an example from a mobile uh, application. And what they have done is they originally had a larger block of code. And then they split this up into two chunks, A and B. They separate these chunks. And then let's say that uh, chunk B is located at address 15. And then at the end of chunk A, you add a jump instruction to address 15. So far, no problem. Like your static analysis tool will still figure out that this is the con like B follows from A. But what they've done then is to instead of having jump to a fixed address, they insert a jump to the value of a register, and then they insert instructions to calculate this uh, uh, address and store it in this register. And this calculation will always have the same value. <clears throat> but we don't know that. Like, for example, if we run the program once, we will see that, OK, it jumps to address 15. But how do we know that it's always 15? Like, maybe there was something in the input that caused it to be specifically 15. And we want to know that we can just directly go to this block B. So our strategy here will be to find all of these places where you have this jump to a register, and then we move backwards a bit in the code. Uh, and then we let anger uh, start from there and run this symbolic execution until we reach this uh, jump point. And then we'll look at the value uh, of this register, which we're jumping to, and simplify that expression and prove that it's a unique value that will always have the same value. And when we've done that, we can patch this program. So we replace the jump to register with jump to the fixed address again. And we have like reunited the code blocks again. So um, yeah, this is just a, a little bit of example code, what this could look like uh, in Angular. So basically, this is a func one function in a larger program where we start searching from some address a bit before the jump, and we search all the way to this jump. And here we can have three different cases. Either we don't know anything about the value of the register, and that means uh, there is information missing, so we didn't go far back enough. So we have to back up a little bit and start again. Or we can have multiple values, and that could mean two things. Either we don't have enough information, or this is actually not uh, an obfuscation place. This is just like a regular switch statement or something. So that's kind of a bit tricky. Or we can have the, the good scenario, which is that we have found one unique value of this register. And that means that we can just replace uh, the jump to register instruction with jump to that specific value. So that would then be used uh, in a function like this, where we, we take one such jump instruction uh, location, and we do a, a breadth-first search backwards in the call graph to find suitable places from which we're going to do this symbolic execution forward. Um, and uh, yeah, we do that until we either have found a unique value for the register or we reach the start of the function. And if we still fail, then this is probably not, it probably doesn't have a unique value. It's probably like a jump, uh, a switch statement or something which actually can have different targets depending on the state of the program. Um, so if we run this uh, on this Example from earlier, 
uh, you see that the last instruction uh, of this first block um, has been replaced. So instead of uh, jump to register x8, we have jump to a fixed address. And now your static analysis tool will uh, be very happy and can continue the analysis and simplify the reversing uh, of this code. Uh, and like you can continue reading the whole uh, function as it should be until we reach another place where this obfuscation had been made and we have to uh, like iterate and do it again. And uh, that's what I had to talk about. Thank you. Thank you.